All right. APU. Apu. Yeah. Apu. What, what this is this is um this is uh, AMD's fancy word for CPU, right? Yeah, it is. And you know, Intel calls them CPUs still with right. integrated graphics, but AMD right. decided to call them accelerated processing units right. because it wasn't confusing enough all the other things you have to keep track of in technology. Hey. You know when it's <laughs> when it's performance versus when it's performance versus branding, the PR people always win. Yeah. Well, you know, the thing is that it kind of, I think they think it makes sense because for them, the strong suit that they have to play is the Radeon graphics. Right. And that makes sense. Definitely no, not the bulldozer smart. processor core family. So well, let's, let's talk about Carrizo then. This is the code name for the next generation of uh, APs for notebooks and convertible PCs. So this is going to be on the sort of fast and light side of things, is it not? Yeah. You know, this is, um, this is kind of AMD's answer to Broadwell. You know, mm. Intel has this lineup of chips that it ships into laptops and desktops that are like dual and quad core and, um, you know, range from like, you know, 15, 17 watts all the way up to like 95 watts. And uh, AMD's APUs counter those. Um, and, you know, they both have integrated graphics. They both have integrated PCI Express. They've integrated more pieces of a PC system over time. And um, this is the next generation from AMD. It replaces the Kaveri chip that we've already like reviewed b before in like the the A10 7800, A10 7850K, various A5 or A8 and A6 iterations of that. Um, AMD also has low power APUs that compete with Intel's Atom-based stuff, but this is more of the higher performance um, than that. So it's a bigger core and, and more powerful graphics and all of that. And Carrizo is a chip that is, I guess it's maybe late, but it's, I'm not sure what the original schedule was, but it was, it is intended to replace Kaveri and it's looking now like it's going to ship in laptops and convertibles mid uh, 2015. So I expect around, you know, June, the Computex time frame will start seeing things beginning to appear. And, um, you know, AMD has had some troubles, Jordan, especially in like the North American market, getting right. design wins where uh, there are laptops widely available in, that are good products, that are interesting products that are based on their chips. They haven't had enough of those. And they're really trying to be aggressive on that front. And at the same time, they have to follow, they have to pursue what Intel has been doing, which is driving down power levels over time. Right. Um, <clears throat> and when Intel first made that move into Ultrabooks, AMD really didn't have a suitably competitive product that could get into that 17-watt Ultrabook power envelope, right? And so um, AMD hasn't been able to, like, go into the same chassis and uh, really compete. And so you've got these, like, clunky-looking AMD-based laptops that are usually cheaper competing against these sleek ultrabooks and then this has been a seller and so they haven't had that so Carrizo attempts to get AMD they're, they're really focused on the uh, they say their power band is like 12 to 35 watts for this chip they're really focused on especially I think that 15 watt optimization point when they made this one. So they've updated everything in the chip with the latest AMD technology. So it has uh, the, a newer x86 CPU core called Excavator. It has somehow mysteriously updated GCN graphics. We don't really know a lot about them. Um, and it has uh, a UVD video decoder block, you know, this sort of a Radeon thing uh, that handles H.265 video, so it can mm. decode 4K in real time without uh, the, G the CPU having to do that. There's a hardware block that can make that happen. Um, and then it has the, the features for what AMD calls HSA, the, the heterogeneous systems architecture, which is their model for accelerating computing tasks by using the, the GPU and the CPU together in a way that's sort of semi-transparently programmed to just use the best available processing resource. Um, and, you know, the, the, they've they kind of updated all of that stuff. What 
what they have disclosed this week, and which what I've, I've kind of written up uh, here, Jordan, is some of the techniques and things that they have done to take this chip that used to, like the prior generations have ranged up to like 100 watts, um, down to 15 or so, and they were sort of less optimal at 15. They've now tried to optimize for that 15 watt to 35 watt, especially the 15 watt power on uh, envelope and so they've done some they made some choices and done some optimizations including the new excavator core and all that to get uh, a good power efficiency at that point and um, one thing that is kind of <laughs> a difficulty a challenge for them is the fact that they're competing using chips that are built on a 28 nanometer process that's the best that they can get from their foundry partners with Intel who is making chips at 14 nanometers now it's two process generations beyond what AMD has and Intel is using what they call tri-gate tri -gate transistors or FinFETs is what they be call, called more broadly but it's basically a different transistor st that is is more efficient and, and let you get to smaller sizes and get benefits like higher switching speeds and lower power consumption, a lower voltage operation when you shrink. Um, and the AMD's foundry partners haven't got there yet. They use traditional planar transistors that, in addition to having larger process geometries. All of that means that their chips are going to be a little bigger, they're going to use a little more power, they're going to run a little hotter, or they're going to have to compromise on clock speeds in order to fit into the same uh, place that, that Intel's do. They've tried to counteract that by making some interesting design choices. So this gets a this gets super technical, Jordan. But I'm going to try to like skip through some of it. Um, this is about design, not architecture. Like the 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 excavator CPU architecture is in Carrizo, a, the Carrizo APU, and it does increase performance by about five percent clock for clock over the prior generation steamroller architecture. But that's not really a big deal in the grand scheme. Uh, the big deal that they've done with Carrizo is optimizing for that 15 watt power envelope uh, on, on the 28 nanometer process. And that's really not architecture, it's, what's, it's basically what's called design. And so the idea here is that you do your circuit design in such a way that you get the, the, or the optimal operation uh, at these low power envelopes. And so one thing that they did was they adopted uh, some design libraries uh, and some design rules that are essentially borrowed from the world of GPUs. And so the they've got an example uh, taking Steamroller and, and the Steamroller core and then putting in some extra features that the Excavator core has and switching to this additional or this different design library at on the same basic 28 nanometer type of process they shrunk the core by like 20 some percent I think it's 23 percent less area um, and the way they did that you can kind of see here in the 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 article there's a cross section a sort of side cross section of the the stack of of metal layers that they used to build the chip and the top layers are much thinner in the GPU oriented stack and so they can pack more transistors in that's a that's an engineering trade-off and, and what you don't get with without those thick layers is you don't have uh, the tolerance for high frequency operation th that you could get um, in the CPU stack and, and so they they kind of offer some some uh, curves in terms of like power and optimization they show they've got a clear win over the prior generation Kaveri with Carrizo using this high density library the, the only issue is that that win kind of peters out when you get around the 20 watt per dual core module mark and so this is a chip optimized for laptops that will be more power efficient in laptops but actually they haven't articulated any plans for a desktop version and the CPU cores built this way probably won't achieve the same clock speeds or do it as efficiently uh, as the prior generation Kaveri. So this is this is AMD saying, look, we think we can win by tackling this market. We're going to build a chip just for that market, and they're giving something up, which is higher power bands. 
Um, and there are several different optimizations that they made that go along with that. Uh, they, they made some choices in the way that they did their device selection for the GPU, the GCN GPUs, the Radeon GPUs, and uh, those operate at lower powers. They probably would not run as high at high clock speeds, but again, the power curves show goodness at, uh, at lower power envelopes especially. And what that lets them do is in the 15 watt version of the chip, prior generation they had eight compute units eight cus and uh, so that's basically like just the the fundamental unit of the graphics processor but they can only enable six and stay in that 15 watt power band with carizo they can enable all eight and stay within the power band so that that optimization helps them there they also have a funky thing a couple of things that are adaptive voltage um and adaptive uh, sort of frequency scaling, and th this gets into Jordan. Have you have you overclocked a CPU, right? I have. For a long and time and so when you overclock a CPU, <coughs> what you what you find out th is that you can get to a certain clock speed on like maybe the stock voltage, and then you push past that, and it starts to get uh, unstable. And right. so in order to go higher, you've got to raise the voltage, or or uh, right raise the voltage and keep the CPU cool but yeah Get temperature affects this a little bit and when you raise the voltage cooling becomes an issue because right. voltage squared determines power consumption of a chip as more than anything else in that equation and so voltage is an extremely important thing to keep low but it also is what you need in order for a chip to run at a given frequency without crashing and so that's those are the dynamics that AMD is playing with with Carizo. So they did a couple of things to deal with that. One of them is that they said that, that most of the time when when they build their CPUs, um, they have had to sort of build in about 10% extra voltage, just because every once in a while voltage will droop. Just in a system in its normal operation, it's not a perfect supply, and so you'll get droops. And if you don't build in what they call kind of guard band, some extra voltage of about 10%, then you could have crashes when the droops happen. But in their latest uh, couple generations of CPU cores, they have built in real time, super fast, like nanosecond level uh, monitoring of voltage on the chips. And when there's voltage droop, they just cut the clock speed temporarily in order hmm. to deal with that. What that lets them do is not have that 10% of extra voltage there as guard band because they have a different mechanism to deal with that. And uh, Sam Nafziger, who's a AMD fellow who explained all this to me, said, you know, these droops happen less than 1% of the time, so it doesn't really have a, a real negative performance impact to drop, voltage or drop frequency in response to it, but it just saves you power. And so what they've done in uh, Carizo, they actually had this this uh, anti-droop adaptive clocking thing in Kaveri CPU cores, but in Carizo they brought it into the GPU as well. And so they've got a power savings uh, in the GPU on that front. The other thing is just for the CPU side, and this is even more advanced voodoo here, they have built into the excavator core, all around the core, 10 different little spots, Jordan, where they have like replica paths of like critical uh, bits of logic from the CPU that are just there to be used to test under the current conditions, voltage, clock speed, temperature, etc. Is it stable? And hmm. they will look at those paths and constantly evaluate their stability in order to de determine what voltage the chip needs to be stable. And by using these little real-time monitoring modules all across the chip, they can know with certainty, or, you know, with, with a pretty good certainty at least, what uh, the lowest vo safe voltage is to operate at. And again, build in less guard band and get uh, lower voltage operation, which saves power. And so this is really interesting. I haven't heard of anybody else doing this type of thing it was it was interesting when they put it into steamroller uh or, or sorry i, I mean it's inter interesting this is the first time in excavator i mean this is interesting stuff it's interesting when they did the the, the other stuff the the voltage adaptive operation in steamroller but but this adaptive voltage and frequency scaling which is another step beyond with the real-time monitoring is really fascinating it's like what I do when I'm overclocking a chip and running like Prime 95 on it or something and, and checking the voltage and seeing if it's, if it's stable. But it's just happening in little pockets all over the chip in ways that 
it's just for monitoring and and then they take that intelligence and uh and, and optimize um so they also have low power standby which is what you need so that your laptop can go to sleep like your iPhone does when you press the lock button and then come back quickly right um hmm. and they can use that they they this is not as fast as what Intel does where it's like active idle constantly pursuing uh uh low power um because they don't have integrated voltage regulation yet, but they're saying that uh, in like less than a second they can they can wake up from this state. So it's kind of along the this 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 power state which they've just added is is similar to the old like PC laptop standby state, but it's something that wakes up about as fast as your iPhone does when you press a home button. Um, so that's that's something that they needed to have in their mobile platform and they've now added it and it it's just uh it's just basically you know the power manager turns off big chunks of the silicon uh and only wakes it up uh every so often as necessary um so that's what they've done in Carrizo to optimize for power it's interesting stuff it's a lot of its design and going for a certain point um, I, I kind of talked about in the article some about how they haven't yet got to the point they said they're going to where um, they have like different blocks of IP like like a CPU graphics video decoder memory controller and then have a common fabric that links that all together that actually isn't happening yet with Carrizo it, it didn't happen with Kaveri and Intel kind of was there with like Sandy Bridge and other SOC makers out there like the Samsung's and Apple's and those guys are doing SOC style design AMD has said they're going to get to SOC style design but right now they still kind of have like a Radeon glued to a bulldozer and um I think there are good reasons to do that. They want to get to t to market quickly. It doesn't mean they can't build a good product, but uh, I think that probably we'll see that in the next generation when AMD introduces a new x86 CPU core. And Jordan, next year, I expect they'll replace Carrizo with a chip that has a b their brand new x86 CPU core. They'll finally, mm. I think, be done with the bulldozer family. Uh, Excavator, I think, will be the last iteration of that and although it looks like it may be much improved I think the new core which is called Zen is where they really start playing seriously uh, to compete against Intel again and they've talked a little bit about that in the presentation actually they didn't talk <laughs> about it but they they showed us stuff that tells you about it um, so I, I and I kind of talk about that if you look on this chart that we've got in, in the article here there's uh, a bunch of features that they put into this product matrix of things that are in development and those are products or the, the purple stuff here and the purple stuff is what's coming in 2016 and 2016 probably means the APU after Carrizo I don't know the code name for it but it's the one with the Zen CPU core almost certainly and they said they're going to have integrated voltage reg regulation and then they've got a number of power management features that they've called out here uh, like uh, per IP adaptive voltage that almost certainly are just consequences of the fact that they've done integrated voltage regulation. That's a big deal because Intel did a, a integrated VR in Haswell. They're in the second generation in Broadwell. With their, they're already doing it and AMD is looking to catch up at the same time they drop a new core uh, that could compete well with Intel's uh, CPU stuff. In addition to that, they've got this advanced bandwidth compression stuff, which probably is what we saw in the, the Tonga GPU it's for the frame buffer compression. It's a very effective, and uh, it looks like that didn't make it into Carrizo's GPU, but it probably will into the one based on uh, Zen. So, although this is really about Carrizo, and, and Carrizo looks like it could be a product that could actually compete with Intel's 14 nanometer chips at 15 watts in ultrabook style or ultra thin, thin style laptops um, which is quite an achievement given that it's you know a 28 nanometer chip it's still the case that this this next generation with based on the Zen stuff is where AMD looks to be playing a huge amount of catch up all at once because of the things that they laid out here because of the fact that it's a new core and um, you know, we're we're getting a little bit more of a glimpse of that. So, we actually don't yet, Jordan. This this is just kind of a, uh, 
a preview of what's happening with Carrizo and the product doesn't come out till mid-year. We don't have uh, product names, pricing, real performance numbers. We just have this like vague energy efficiency chart that they provided that shows a big increase. Um, I I trust that there are good things coming. I think that the, the things they shared are interesting and, and can be quite effective. But um, all that stuff comes later when Carrizo gets closer to being a real product. Um, we saw working silicon for this chip at CES. We're getting mm. more insight now. I think they're they're doing this like rolling thunder thing with the PR. We'll probably have another one or two hits before the products come out where they share some more details about what this is. Interesting. Good times, man. I I think that it's it's interesting because they they went for laptops big, and I hope that means they get some design wins because that's what they really need. They've got to stay in the market. And um, I don't know that there will be a socketed version of this. I think we might see it on the desktop in all-in-ones like the iMac. Not necessarily the iMac, but like the iMac. Right, right, um, right. Could be the iMac, maybe, someday. I don't know. They, if they do really well um, and if the Radeon graphics becomes attractive, maybe someday they could win that Apple business. I think that's a hard thing to do. But... Um, but I don't know that we're going to see a socketed version of this because given the amount of optimization they did for lower power points, I don't think it would translate all that well into 65 watts or above. I think that probably it's not better than Kaveri, which frankly was not that much faster than Richland. In some cases, it was a little slower because they've been going for this low power target for a couple generations. Um, and I think that they can get out of that. I think they can get back to higher power envelopes with Zen, um, but in order to do that, they need to be really competitive on architecture, not just design, and maybe on process tech. They probably need their foundry partners to get to like their 16, 14 nanometer FinFET-based process in order to allow AMD to uh, have the leeway to build a product that will scale further instead of targeting as directly as they have with Carrizo. But, you know, that's not where we are yet, and it, it looks like Carrizo could be uh, reasonably competitive. We don't have any hard numbers yet, but it could be reasonably competitive, even though it's 28 nanometers and Intel's at 14. 